Um, this morning's speaker is uh, Karen Holtzblatt, who is the recipient of the first Lifetime Achievement Award in the area of practice. And I think it's probably a long overdue recognition both for the area and for Karen herself. Uh, Karen certainly is one of the leaders in the design community, uh, well known for her work uh, on uh, contextual design. And um, she uh, is the founder and the head of uh, uh, In Context Enterprises. Uh, she's got numerous contributions, several books, uh, ex extensive experience. She's done a lot of teaching, both uh, at professional meetings and in university settings. And this morning, we're honored to have her share her ideas with us. Um, she's planning to talk for, uh, I guess, maybe 50 to minutes to an hour, and then we'll, take, we'll have time for questions, which we'll take from the mics that are on the floor. So, Karen? Thanks, Gary. So, guys, let me know that we can hear. I'm with new technology, and it's not my technology, and they don't think anyone's going to walk, clearly. Have you, you know, like I've been into like practical innovation and making things work for people in real settings. And what I'd really love to do one day is redesign presentation centers. Have you ever seen a presentation center and a presentation system that actually work? I mean, it's really, really awful. So I'm very honored by the Academy to receive the first award in practice, and lest we not really understand what that means. <laughs> practice means that you're not in a research setting. I, you know, I suppose that's the very first meaning of the word practice, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't do research. We probably, at In Context, have done more base research on how people work and what people do in the last 19 years and in the 23 years in total that we've been working uh, on contextual stuff. And those of us that are in practice know that we are really doing lots of research in the field. And you know, much of it, however, is proprietary. Because the other piece of what it means to be practical is that you are delivering systems for companies that people use and people buy. And that's part of what's going on. So I thought that today it would be fun to talk about, well, what is practical innovation? Right? Because the, the universe is full of people. OK, is there magic to this? Ah. I don't trust. This is not my clicker. The universe is full of people who are dying to find out how to innovate. Right? Looking for the secret sauce is on everybody's tongue. And especially anytime anybody actually is successful at said thing, like when the iPhone came out, that was it. Every client was running around going, I need an iPhone. Where's my iPhone? How am I going to make a lot of money like the iPhone? Why can't our organization produce a thing like the iPhone? So, Understanding innovation and understanding what's really going on with innovation is key for all companies because they believe that this I word, this I word is going to be a huge business case for them. That's effectively what's going on. And I thought it would be interesting today to start to talk about what it means to create innovations, to create product that is successful in the market, that is game changing in order for us to understand the difference between what you'll hear me talk about as foundational innovation and practical innovation, which has to do with shipping product by companies to people who buy them. Yeah? OK. So let's think about that together. It's getting really loud. Do you hear it? It feels too loud to me. So now, in case you wondered why they're giving me this award, I'm not going to be talking about contextual design today. But these are the steps of contextual design. And we introduced contextual design or contextual inquiry, which you might have heard about you know, years ago. Um, when did we introduce contextual inquiry? Maybe 23 years ago, about 23 years ago. 
which, oh, by the way, is a little bit of, you know, when we're thinking about practical innovation, you can think about process innovation as well. And we're going to be talking a lot about time. So for those of you who haven't heard this story, OK, when I first came into the industry, I didn't actually know this. When I first came into the industry, usability and this organization was about four years old. And you know, at the time, I thought it was like established. Now, many years later, I realized that it was like a toddler. It, maybe it wasn't even more than 18 months old, right? As, as things go. And the primary thing that was going on is there was a set of people who were really frustrated because I don't know what your organizations looked like, but Hugh and I came from digital equipment. And what development looked like at that time was 10 smart guys were in a room, and let me assure you, they were guys. And they said, this is cool. Don't you love this technology? Oh my god, look what we can make. And they talked to each other. And let me assure you, that's only people that they talked to. And then they called in marketing. And they said to marketing, look at this. This is cool. And marketing would say, well, who's that for? Why would anyone want it? They said, what's wrong with you? This is technology. This is cool. And that was engineering-driven design. And that was what the universe looked like when we came in. Now, at that point, John Whiteside, and I don't know who here remembers John Whiteside. He ran the Sioux Group at Digital Equipment. And he was an innovator and a forward-thinking person. And he was asking a question in some J random Chi thing that I came to in a, in a career transition. And he wanted to know, well, we know that usability testing, it's tail end. It comes after the concept comes in. What would we do? if we wanted to talk about a generative process, how we can think of what we should make, not how to fix stuff, right? That comes at the tail end. Because the tail end, well, you know, it's already there. You can fix about 10 or 12% of it, and that's true today. Any kind of usability testing is never going to ask the question, does anyone want this? It's going to fix what's in front of your face, because that's the way it goes with users. You show them something nice, a cool demo, or anything like that, they go, oh, all finished. Let me give you a little bit of advice on the words, or the colors, or the buttons, or what have you. So that question was on the table, and I didn't know anything. And Terry Winograd had, had his book come out, and they were starting to talk about heuristic, or like what's going on at that time. So some, a few of you are old enough to know what I'm talking about. And I was like, what? Because my background is in, I'm going to say a big, long word that's a real scary word, phenomenological research and interdisciplinary design. And so I'm walking into this place, having been doing this for a long time, and, and thinking, why are you asking this question? If you want to understand what you should make for people, go out into the field, what they're doing, while they do it. And then you know technology, and you'll invent the solution given the technological possibilities of the time. Well, the first paper I ever wrote was called Phenomenological Research Methods in the Study of Human-Computer Interaction. This was rejected by Kai. <laughs> there were debates at the time, and I was called a mystic. I think that there's a paper in which it's written down that I'm a mystic and a heretic. And so the idea that you would go into the field, instead of being a lab, the idea that you didn't have to have A-B testing or E word, an experiment word associated, it was like, but this is really the way it was. And I'm like, wait a minute, chip stuff. What we need is get insight. So anyway, we. And John introduced me. Well, it's their problem. <laughs> Move up. Is that working? I don't know what they're doing. Mic people, are you functioning? Off, right? Now it's on. It's off and
fix it. Isn't it great when you're at Kai Technology? When I teach people how to present, I teach them how you're always on, even when you have problems. All right, so what were we doing? We were being rejected from Kai. So, so in any case, you know, but something magical happened, because a bunch of people listened. And uh, about five years after all those rejections, people were like, wow, if you go out into the field, you learn stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah. About five years after that, they were like, what do you do with all this qualitative data? And then they started, when Hugh and I started to develop the rest of the steps of contextual design. So contextual design is a, for those of you that don't know, is a front end field data gathering process that goes all the way from understanding the customer, modeling the data, helping teams figure out what's going on, generating product solutions. That's that first half that's up there. And then in the second half, well, just because you have an idea, and even if it comes from data, you still don't throw it over the wall, not time to start coding. We better work it out. And then we stole some ideas from Pella N and Aarhus University and did paper mock-ups and iterated with that until we could validate the concept. And today, this is contextual design. And those are our books. And it's been an incredible, incredible journey because those books are used by universities and companies all over the world to teach people how to understand people, and how to drive generative design. Now, the, whoops, I didn't want to do that. All right, so the center, the center of contextual design is field data together. And at the time, we couldn't use the word phenomenological. We were surely not talking about anthropology. And so Sandy Jones and I sat around thinking up what word we could use to try to talk about what this was. And every, anything that we were talking about at the time, um, I would keep saying, what are you doing in the lab? It's completely out of context. You can't, it's not real life. How are you going to understand what's going on with people in real life? There's the whole cultural milieu. There's the social interaction. There's the real task. There's the real load of every real day. And if you really want to understand what's going on, you've got to get out in the field. And so after brainstorming many ideas, of which I can't remember anymore what they were, we came up with the word contextual. And in case you were ever wondering where that word came from, that came from Sandy Jones and I kicking around what word we could use instead of phenomenological research methods in the study of computer-human interaction. And contextual, from a branding perspective, was practical. And so that is where the origin of that word came. But the core, the core, is getting out into the field. All right, now this is where it's sneaky, OK? Because it's not just about design from customer data. Now I know why the table was here. It's not just about design from customer data. It's the design from field data. It's the design from field data. It's the design from going out into the field and talking, listen to my language, talking with people about what they do while they're doing it. Note, I did not say. Videotaping people and going home and asking yourself what they, you think they did, OK? I'm saying be there and be in dialogue, like airplane intimacy, and understand in the moment of life what's happening. And here's the key. If you've never heard me talk before, this is like the only thing you really need to get, OK? People know everything about what they do. They just can't tell you. Now, this is critical. You really have to get this. If you get this, you understand why usability tests, focus groups, surveys, and any other technique that relies on asking people anything isn't going to work. OK, why? People know everything about what they do, but they can't tell you. When was the last time you watched yourself live your life? You might tweet yourself to death. But you are not watching yourself tweet. 
okay? And if you ever want evidence of this, go try to go grocery shopping and think about what you are thinking about in order to make a decision. I mean, even people in the Kai community cannot interpret themselves while they are living their life. Because the mode of life is autonomic, it's automatic, you're in it, you're reactive, you're coming, you're fully present in your being. And the mode of interpretation is observational, yeah? You're outside of yourself, you're watching. So the only way you can understand the motivations, the behaviors, the habits, what is done without thinking, what is really happening in the universe is to have something, some reality here, and then be in dialogue. But if we're in dialogue alone, like talking to myself about what's happening in reality, then I'm like making it up, right? So the only way is to engage the user in interpretation, which means watch, then talk, then live, then talk, then live, then talk. And that is field day together. Whether you call it anthropology, contextual inquiry, or any other thing, being in the moment is different kind of data than anything else. But what am I trying to collect? What I'm trying to collect is knowledge on practice. I am not trying to collect design ideas, and I'm not trying to collect feature lists, and I'm not trying to collect anything like that. And this is critical for us to understand is that innovation, ideation, comes when you are immersed in the data and in the technology, and out of that you see possibility. And that's really it. And today, many, many people will raise their hand if you say, who uses field data gathering? And we still have a long way to go, because many, many people still sit in a room and make it up. Yeah? All right, so let's really look at this, because there's some argument going on in the blogosphere about whether field data gathering is re can really be related to innovation. So I think we have to unpack some of what's happening, and, I, and that's it. I'm like done talking about contextual inquiry, contextual design. I want to talk about what's happening with innovation. What is practical innovation? What are the elements of innovation? And I am also tired of the iPhone, OK? I was uh, at a, uh, a comedy session with Seinfeld recently. And it's already like a joke. He's like, aren't you sick of it? And he's standing there, he's going, everyone comes up and goes, the pinch, did you see the pinch? Oh, look, I can turn it, I can turn it, I can turn it, I can turn it. You know, when it's already gravitated to Seinfeld, you know that it's institutionalized, yeah? So let's look at something else, my favorite current innovation, and let's unpack Avatar. I mean, let's like think about what this guy did, because we're going to learn something about our own industry if we do that. All right, now, over $2 billion, that would be game changing, don't you think? It looks like, wow, he just changed the definition of what filmmaking is. And he invested over, what? $400 million of his own money? That was like quite an entrepreneurial kind of uh, risk, don't you think? You got an extra $400 million around that you want to put in? Now, the interesting piece is, well, how scary was this? So let's, you know, let's take a look at it and see if we can understand something about what went into this. All right, now, every innovation that's ultimately changing, has an element of it that is really new, that fundamentally transforms, interestingly, fundamentally transforms human experience. In this case, what Cameron was doing is he was creating motion capture techniques and camera techniques, and I'm just bad on words, and I'm going to use my cheat sheet here. They call it augmented reality. It's interesting to wonder if it's augmented reality, if it's just like a completely alternative reality is what's really going on. What you see there is Cameron looking into a screen where he can see simultaneously 
the actors who are all wired up for facial and motion capture in the animated background with their animated clothes on. Now, how cool is that? He is seeing live the acting. Now, what is that doing to their experience? Take a look at what Spielberg is talking about here, right? Right now, this is almost like live theater, except it's pretend live theater. It's virtual live theater, where he's watching and directing, and he can stop things as they go. If we look at his own quotes, they're going to give us an idea of what the fundamental user experience, and in this case, it's the director's experience we're talking about, right? The fundamental, central transformation that had to do with Avatar. And you'll follow me in a minute. Listen to his language. It's a form of pure creation. Think about it. From thought to reality. From thought to reality. He can see it. He can move a tree. Talk about control, right? All of the intervening things are gone. And what about the hassle factor? We get rid of the actors getting makeup on, getting makeup off, right? Fixing the costume, little guy coming in, going out. They've eliminated, you know, the poor actors have to walk around with all these sensors all over them, right? But they don't have to retake scenes. They don't have to keep getting their makeup fixed. Can you imagine in the old days wearing all that blue body? That would be Blue Man Group. Can you imagine it sweating off? I mean, really, it could be gross. All the costume fitting, it's gone. We have digital costumes. From thought to reality with control. How cool is that? That piece, in the end, is what differentiates and changes the director game. And that last piece, though, is built on a long history of steps. So let's take a look at what's going on. We have existing technology. He worked extensively with Autodesk. They were working on Motion Builder, which is the you know, ex the part of Autodesk that, that is building animated characters and has been working in the movies for years, they'd already delivered a whole series of things before this. Adding additional things to Motion Builder was a step. It was not utter radical transformation coming out of the primordial mud. It was a step. And, you know, this was, I loved this piece, okay? 10,000 square feet of a server farm, 4,000 servers to make a movie. Just like, let that sink in for a minute. But I mean, that's just a server farm. We've been doing the web and Google and, right? We know how to manage and do gigantic server farms. It's not really that big a deal. It's expensive. It's not that big a deal. And then, you know, OK, how about George Lucas's help? You want some help from somebody who's got experience and has been doing things for quite some time? He's taking a step. He's not doing any radical transformation here. It's a gentle step and stretch. It's a gentle step and stretch. And it's consistent with what has come in the past. It's deliverable. All right, let's take a look at what's happening in the technology of delivering the film that is leading up. And I'm going to start you back in 1988. And again, I don't know how old you guys are. Roger Rabbit. Do you remember Roger Rabbit? Who framed Roger Rabbit? This is the first time. We, we mucked about with Mary Poppins before this, with a few animated characters decorating the scene, if you remember Mary Poppins with your kids. But this is the first time. We've got two things going on. We targeted adults, and we have like this full-size animated character playing with human beings. But of course, the way they did it, the character looked like Bugs Bunny. And also, yeah? And also, putting the parts together is hard. We've got the Bugs Bunny thing going over here and the people thing going on over there. All right, so that's step one. Let's take a look at step two. Jurassic Park. Do you remember those guys? Remember all those dinosaurs running around? You know? We've got photorealistic, CG-enhanced characters running around again in pieces, separated, can't see the whole thing, not brought together. All right, now, do you remember Toy Story? All of a sudden, adults start going to cartoons. We're taking our kids, but really, adults are going, you know, they've given up the ghost now. Now they just make cartoons for adults. 
But he, this was really 3G, 3D, right? We could start to see it. It looked like, you know, they weren't like these flat Bugs Bunny things anymore. They were these three-dimensional creatures. And then what's going on? Do you remember Gollum? The guy won an award. He wasn't even a person. But we started with motion capture at this time, and so he's human with the things pretending to be an animal, yeah? Pretending to be an animal. And then they're animating it, and he's playing throughout the whole film. So we're learning as we go. Now, what's interesting about these prototypes is they're all making money. Are you watching the dollar amounts here? We are not shipping garbage in order to see whether or not this works, and the user will, like, you know, handle it. Oh, they'll work around. Well, who are the early adopters? You know, you don't get all that in motion pictures. You either made money or lost money. That's all it. These prototypes are making money as they learn about their technology. So what happens next? OK, Polar Express turns out to be this game-changing movie. We don't exactly get it until we start to look a little bit at business models. But this is the first CGI movie. So we've got all digital, which means we have much more flexibility than we did before. And all actors are motion capture. So now we've got a whole bunch of people running around with electrodes, yeah, making the movie. We've moved into another place of possibility. But still, you know, it's, all, it's only making 162 million. I mean, it's not, it's not 2 billion. We haven't gotten there yet. We haven't done this game-changing thing. So let's keep going. What's happening in the industry? OK, Beowulf didn't make much money, but wow, was it a critical piece. Because it's the first time they could use the same film for 2D and 3D. So we are starting to be able to imagine the possibility of the next requirement, which is distribution. Yeah? All right, so let's think about that. So let's take a look at this. So we had started with Dolby. Let's follow it up a little bit. All right, back in 2001, there were like, Three digital film titles and one camera. Disney gave it away. We're really not going to get much money made if we have one camera that can play the digital film, right? This is not going to work. OK. So by 2002, we got 120 digital screens. The Star Wars episode was now the first one that was dis distributed digitally. And we started with specs and standards. You know that as soon as you start with specs and standards, something is starting to settle down, yeah? Something is starting to settle down. So we need to know when something is useful, when it can be used as a material in practical design. And when we start to see a consistent, reliable usage, then that starts to be something we can be working with. But you know, we don't have enough screens yet to make any money. All right. So in 2006, we're starting to get this interest in 3D. There's a limited number of projectors. And in 2007, we're starting to have a series of movies that are being released in 3D. So what we're actually getting is a controlled experiment, right? Where we can start learning as we're going along. All right, now we've got about 55 screens, excuse me, 55 theaters, 500 screens. Even if you do a, a quick estimate of how much money you make, make per screen, you're still not getting up to a number that's going to allow you to put that kind of money into the, into the film. And now, government is getting in the act, so it's really starting to be interesting. And in the UK, the government is funding more screens. And in 2010, now we have a, a provider. So we have services to get these screens up there. All right, now we need IMAX if we're going to get to Avatar. So let's see what happens with that. All right, so 1986, that's, of course, introduced at the World's Fair, the greatest place to introduce interesting new technology and see what happens to it. So that's, you know, but nothing's really going to start happening. Right now, it moves into museums. This is another prototyping environment, public spaces and museums. And so, you know, you go and you watch a big fish and all that kind of stuff, and that's cool, and you take your kids, but it's like not real film, right? Not real film yet. OK, so then what happens? All right, here's our big switch. Because in 2004, all right, this is the business case demonstration for 3D film. It's a combination of Harry Potter and Polar Express making so much money that you can start to build a business case for investing $400 million. That's what we're talking about here is, well, how much of a risk was it 
for Cameron to really be putting his money into that kind of thing. And we're starting to see that the people are flocking, but we don't have that many theaters yet. All right, so we went from 66 theaters in 2004 to, six, to 179 theaters in 2007. Now you can do the math yourself. Put one or two million dollars at each theater, and by 2010, when you have over 7,000 theaters, it is actually not that big a risk to spend $400 million worth of investment if you can see that all these films are making this much money. It's not that big a risk. You know, it's kind of reasonable. All right, now what? Let's talk about human taste. What's happening in that taste? These are the top 10 grossing movies of all time. Okay, all time. All right. Guess who made Titanic? And what's that about? Let's think about taste. Love, action, cool special effects, yeah? All right, let's look at the next one. Lord of the Rings, fantasy, magic, yeah? And we're getting the old population that all read it. Okay, all right, what's next? Pirates of the Caribbean, a nice integration between animation and people, sort of like the silly man's three musketeers, you know? That kind of thing, and everybody's going to this. And look how much money it made. All right, what's next? Comics, comic books, Batman, action, animated characters. All right, what's next? Uh, Harry Potter already blew the entire market away in books and now is doing the same thing in the movies. All right, what are the next ones? Just repeats, same set until we get to, oh, Star Wars, well, that's not much of a risk. Okay, let's look at top grossing movies in 2000. These same ones and now we add, oh, comics, characters, stretchy characters in tight suits running around, everybody's going to it, and Shrek, the really adult movie that you take your kids to because you want to see it. All right, now let's talk about market taste then. What is it really? What is Avatar? Oh, is it action and special effects, animation for adults, comic books and magic with a little bit of love and a lot of champions? You know, one man against the world. They're very big in America, right? One man against the world. So Avatar, if you want to think about it from a design perspective, is pretty smart, integrated the whole thing into one package. Everything is in place. A new user practice, the technology, the distribution, the market readiness. There's a real business model. I mean, really, Avatar is kind of a boring next step, isn't it? <laughs> All right, how about this guy? How about this guy? Oh, aliens. I guess he knows something about science fiction. Yeah? All right. What else? 3D water effects in the abyss. He's doing his own prototyping. OK, 1991. Do we remember the Terminator? So we've got the human movements. Actually, what preceded that, right? What, what preceded that? Total recall. I was right, but I didn't trust myself. OK, so he does a tiny prototype of the skeleton running through the x-ray machine. Do you remember that? He embeds his tiny prototype inside of his movie to see what's going on. How smart is that? And at the same time, he then uses it in Terminator. All right, pretty cool. 1996, he writes the script for Avatar. Ten full years before he decides to make it. I want you to ask yourself something about whether your companies have a long view. Then he gets into Titanic, makes enough money to indulge in his personal fantasy, which is in the ocean which is the basis for the design of the incredible avatar environment. And then 
he makes a deal and he starts working on the camera. All right. So let's see if this will work. I don't trust technology. Doesn't look like it's happening. Oh, here it comes. Can you hear this? I did our time before before we started on it so that we didn't we didn't stumble and fall on our face. And even so, it was very very difficult. Even though we waited, kind of, I, I waited ten years to start it, and it's been you know four and a half years to make, which is twice the length of time it took to make Titanic. So it's been it's yeah you know, I'm ready for a rest, but but I can't complain at all because it was such a, a joyful process to make this film. He did it on purpose. He waited. He waited on purpose. All right. So if we take a look at it. He spent 10 years with market readiness happening until there were over 7,000 theaters so that he could build the business case so it was completely reasonable for this man to do this investment. It was just the next right thing. It was just the next right thing for him. So what are our elements? A real business mission and skill on the part of the organization with a deep understanding of the practice you're going to transform and technology, what you will deliver to the market habit and value built on a delivery infrastructure and a business model. So if you want to ask the question, what do you need for practical innovation? That is your answer. That is your answer. A game-changing innovation ultimately is simply doing the next right thing. But it's not just the next right thing in the universe. It's the next right thing for that particular company with that particular skill in that particular industry. Yeah. All right, now let's go to our favorite guy. And now it's going to be boring, because guess what? The iPhone is just the next right thing. It's just the next right thing. It has that pinch and the twist and the fun. But it's built on Apple's existing experience. It's built on technology readiness, where the wireless is everywhere, and people can get it, and it's not a big deal problem. It's built on, do you remember? Do you remember how bad it was eight years ago and how slow it was? And you'd never be getting video and all that stuff at that time until we got 3G and it was all over the place. Do you remember that eight, nine years ago the smartphone was just being introduced and nobody was using it and all the thing that was doing was, you know, downloading ringtones and there was like a couple of games and stuff like that on these phones and you couldn't make any money and nobody knew what was going on? No, not when they delivered. And what? We're used to this touchscreen stuff now. We're using it in our GPS systems. We're using it at the grocery store. We're using it in kiosks. It's already there. The beginning is already there. There is a technical infrastructure. And what about the consumers? Well, they're running around obsessed, right? We know that. Everybody's got to have their phone. You are running around. And this was way before the iPhone. But, you know, everyone would put their phone on the table. I'll never forget this. I'm the first of six in my family. We get together. Everyone gets around the table, the whole family, they put their phone on the table, start talking about their phone. I mean, everybody has a phone. Everyone is expected to have a phone. This was before there were smartphones of any type. We were all hooked up. And like we were Googling our brains out. We were buying stuff online. There was content at the time that this came out, because eight years ago, that was not happening. And I'll tell you what else was not happening. We were not running around using navigators and MapQuest. There was no Facebook. And today, there's content that's out on the web. And somebody figured out how to make a couple bucks on this content, because eight, nine years ago, nobody had figured out how to make any dollars on that whatsoever. All right. And how about the distribution or the business model? Well, you know, we know how to make computers. Apple sure knows how to make computers. They know how to make operating systems. They know how to make screens. They did all that stuff. OK. 
the iPod extended this model. You know, what is it? An iPod is a stick. I mean, an iPod is a fancy stick. You could put a lot of stuff on the stick and fancy it up, but it's a stick nonetheless with a way to navigate inside the stick. OK, so that's base technology right there. What else was going on? Well, they opened a retail store, did this before, learned how to be near the customer. What else is going on? Well, we had Napstar fail. Wasn't that good for Apple? Because nobody had figured out the business model yet for music and iTunes, just like Polar Express, is really a game-changing piece. But you didn't really exactly get how game-changing it was, because all they're doing now is repeating the model. Yeah? All right. Had to have a, a deal with AT&T because it isn't going to be able to distribute if we don't have a deal. And you know, it wasn't like the phone companies, let me assure you, because I know eight years ago, they wanted a cut of every dollar so much. And they were telling all the hardware companies, you better build it like this. You have to build it like that. I don't know how they did that deal. But without that deal, there'd be no iPhone. And then think about Apple's developer network that they already had. People were already developing to spec. They knew how to do it. And then they just copied the App Store. It's just like, you know, a version of iTunes, yeah? Kind of boring, you know, when you do the analysis. If we just look at Apple's mission and skill, they figured out the graphics back in 1998, yeah? That graphics were exciting. They learned all about that, and they themselves had their failed prototype, yeah? In the Newton. And they learned about that. It's important to have failures along the way. And then, what happened? Well, look at that. 1999, Apple registers for iPhone.org. You think they were thinking about it more than an hour before they ship? 2003, we've got real downloads. And in 2002, Apple's filing for an iPhone trademark. They're not shipping yet. They're planning. Yeah? They're learning about their failures in other areas. They're getting video, and they're working out the whole video thing in the video iPod. And yes, they tried a distribution prototype with you know, the Roker, which like, wasn't very exciting. And so it didn't work. And they're like, OK, I can't do that. And maybe not with those guys. So 2007, it's launched. And if they are registering in 1999, it means they're thinking about it before that. And we've got another kind of 8 to 10 year gap. So what are we talking about here? Practical design. In fact, any design is about the recombination of known parts. Any kind of innovation, any kind of design is taking existing materials and combining and recombining them in order to achieve an intent of value. It's about the recombination of parts. In fact, I say to my people, if you want to know who's good, who can do this kind of work, yeah, there's an empirical test. How good are you at Rummy Q or Scrabble? What are, what are those games? You see the whole context of the board. And you're doing combination, recombination, combination, recombination, combination, recombination in your brain. Anybody who's a designer, they win that game all the time. Because that is the fundamental skill. Because we don't create innovative things out of the primordial mud. Only God got to do that. What we do is take the existing materials, and we combine them and recombine them in ways we understand. In other words, they are known parts. We have materials that work. Now, this is the critical piece here. Because practical innovation, practical innovation works with things that already are mature. Foundational innovation, of which you can see a lot around here, is also the recombination of known parts. But you know, that might be like electricity was just discovered. What can I do with it? That is not a thing we're going to practically innovate at this time. We've got to like monkey about with electricity for a while before we can understand it. Or maybe the utility company goes, um, God, maybe if only I could control those crummy consumers. They waste electricity. And so somebody says, oh, maybe we can get these parts to talk to each other. 
And they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to make your refrigerator talk to the utility company. So some guys are sitting around going, what are we going to do? Or you could have walked into the Microsoft bubble yesterday, right? Pinch the sky or whatever. We've got some foundational innovation going on there. That's not ready for prime time. That's foundational innovation. One day, some of it will be ready. Just like the smart grid people are figuring out today that probably real people, even though they can have their parts talk to each other, aren't going to let anybody reach into their house and turn their freezer off for five minutes every hour so they can save money. You gonna do that? I would speak to someone recently and telling them that's what I was at this event, this conference, and they were like, if they're gonna do that, then, and they're gonna affect my air conditioning, there better be a big stop button when I walk in the house that says I want all my stuff back. What happens is that technologists have, there's always basic questions that have to be answered. Lots of them, they don't need field data. You know, because like if you're trying to make it bigger, faster, smarter, smaller, yeah? get this to talk to that, what's the language, what's the protocol? We don't need field research for that because that's about creating materials. That's about creating materials for innovation. But I'm waiting because practical innovators wait until the stuff, the materials are ready for prime time. When I came to my first CHI 20 years ago, and I'm bad at names and I'm bad at numbers, there was this cool thing. There was a pad on the ground and you would stand on it and you could like dance and it would move stuff around the walls. Okay? So somebody's gonna remember the name of that thing and I don't. And I said at that time, I think we called it virtual reality or whatever, and you know, there was a lot of gloves and glasses and stuff going on. More materials in development. And um, I said, one day, we're going to walk into homes, we're going to have a room, and the room's going to have walls, or maybe not even walls, and we're going to be able to play games and move and dance and interact, and I'm waiting. It's been over 20 years. What are the steps along the way to that, though? The Wii is one of them, right? And some of the game stuff, but we're not there yet because it isn't all there yet. The materials aren't there for practical innovation. Foundational innovation helps us create new materials at every level. Practical innovation uses materials to deliver transformational value to people's lives with a twist. And the twist is always a fundamental transformation of user experience. Always bringing everything together so they make it smoother, easier, taking away the hassle. Practical innovation is delivering stuff that works. All right, so can field data help? What do we need? This is essential. If the company doesn't have a clear concept, how focused was Cameron? How focused did the Apple people have to be in order to know I am on this path, I am not leaving this path, this is absolutely what I'm going to do for 10 years, I'm going to stay on that path. How focused do you have to be if you're going to get where you want to go? You must know what is going to be transformational. And field data helps you know. When you get out in the field and you can understand the practice of people, and you understand what your company can deliver, because it better be for your core business mission, not just cool stuff in the universe. It's got to be delivered by a company, and that becomes critical. Field research tells you what's in the world as it relates to you. And because you know that, and you know technology, you can imagine this next future for you, for your company, and you better stay on point. You better stay on point. When the web came in, publishing was challenged. We're actually in a revolution right now. All of the big box stores, all of publishing, right? Even the enterprise solution companies, even the software companies that were innovators themselves years ago are all being challenged by the cloud, by technology transformation. 
But back in the beginning, when the web existed, the publishers, they didn't know what to do, so they threw everything up on the web, and then they failed, and then they called us. Just like they didn't know what they were doing. But one of our clients, where they produced a humongous multi-hundred page report and saw the web, said, I see, I see what it would be like to put this up and to simplify access to the information in this report for our people. This is a publishing company. But she didn't know how. She could see, like I can see the house with the walls, right? She didn't know what could she combine that were known materials that would result in value. And her focus groups told her that whatever they were thinking didn't match anything that was recognizable to their people. So when they called us, they said, go out, find out what's really going on with the practice. So when we designed this online report, anyone could use it. And they were game changing, and they knocked everybody else out of the market. Not because it was such a great innovation, but because they figured out how to put it online in a way that worked for people. You must have clarity of concept. And that means the business. That doesn't mean a UX person. So you know, our job is to help them understand. There is always the twist. It's user practice transformation. It's about bringing everything together. If you look at anything, the core is what? With the director, bringing it all together so he can see the world as it is. Bringing him back to the natural. What's really happening with the iPhone? Where somebody said, you know, I can stick it in my pocket. My world is with me anywhere I go. I don't have to plan anything. I don't have to think what restaurant. I don't have to figure out, print out my directions, and I don't have to worry about how I'm going to get near my friends. I'm just like, it's with me. It's all together. I got a life in a pocket. That's the twist. It's not even the pinch. What about technology readiness? It better work. You can't put stuff that doesn't work out there over and over and over and think anyone's going to trust you. But you can get out into the field and find what we call the hassle factor. And if you come home and you just take away the hassle factor, think about TVs for the moment. Right? Think about the fact TVs are another challenged industry. I want you to imagine your living room for a moment. Then I want you to think about how many boxes and clickers you have. Then I want you to think about all the wires. Then I want to think about your computer. Then I want you to think about where you keep all your media. And then I want you to ask, what is the next right thing for television? I mean, it's like not a big leap once you actually start thinking about the idea of just whoosh, get rid of the hassle factor and get out there. Or decide if you're shipping it. It's a prototype. But can you be like Cameron? Can you ship a prototype that has a small piece in it and the rest of the whole product is really still successful? Because that's the smart way to do it. Or you're going to do that a lot better if you understand your user and if you iterate your design. Distribution readiness, this is critical. Back when we started the company, we worked with a company that made small measuring device boxes and they wanted to reinvent their business. So we went out into the field to take a look at an adjacent user population, came back with a software solution for help desk before there was a lot of PC anywhere or trouble ticketing or anything like that, because people were being hassled to death trying to get to remote stuff. And they let that hang around for a while until they finally canceled it. Why did they cancel it? They knew how to make software. They knew how to sell product. But they didn't know how to make software as a customer-facing product and they had no idea how to sell it. If your sales force doesn't know how to sell the thing you're making, it ain't going anywhere. You either have to develop a new distribution channel or you have to figure out how to change that company. Distribution will knock out practical innovation any day of the week. And market readiness. What is that habit? Where are the people at? What is their taste? What are they willing to tolerate? My mother is going to be 80. I said to my mom, what is the coolest thing you ever experienced? And now she has a Mac at home, which she cannot use very well, and calls somebody all the time to say, this happened. This happened. What happened? She does not think that that's a great innovation, let me assure you. And she said to me, 
the electric typewriter. She said, oh my god, the electric typewriter was the most amazing thing. And we talked about the transition between, some of you might actually remember this, all that wonky typing and scraping holes in the paper and all this stuff. I mean, the correctotype was an amazing innovation. But for her, the memory is of where she was, right, to the electric typewriter. The delta was where was her ground. The cool thing, the transformative thing, was a reach and stretch. It was the next right thing from her base. The computer is not the next right thing from her base. Have you ever tried to teach someone who doesn't know anything whatsoever about what a window is or an application? God knows an operating system? I mean, they have no idea what you're, it is a foreign language and they cannot learn it. That delta cannot be reached from where they are. Where is your market? What is the delta? Is your market ready? Or have you become falling in love with technology so much that you're putting in stuff that people can't reach because they're not going to think it's cool if they have to stretch and exhaust themselves and call their children all the time, continuously. And it's a system management event whenever you get there. It's really horrible. Please take care of the kids. Quit doing that. So we have to look at failure, and we have to get into the field because we want to gather data on the failure as well because that's going to tell us what we need to put in. And it's good to put these prototypes out so we can see what happens with the delta. If you can't make money from it, it just doesn't exist. That is the base thing of practical innovation. The job of a business is to stay in business. That is why it exists. Because if it didn't stay in business, you would not get a salary. And if you didn't get a salary, you couldn't pay your mortgage. And if you didn't pay your mortgage and buy your cars, the economy would collapse, as we all well know. But more importantly, you couldn't take care of your kids. And that is what I learned over 23 years ago when I saw Deming, that the job of business is to stay in business. And that is part of practical innovation. If it's not going to keep you in business and make business, what are we doing? There's a way to make money and change lives at the same time. And we know it. So, and the last piece is so critical. We have a lot of people complaining. Every single business can invent the next practical innovation that's appropriate for them, but it has to be appropriate for them. If they don't have the skill, if it is not in their business mission, no one's going to invent it. Ten years ago, we did a field study which said that the web should be a place for people to collaborate, that there should be negotiation places, that there would be group conversations, and that dialogue should be around the artifact. And this was all based on field data. We gave it to a company. They delivered none of it. And over the course of the next 10 years, every single piece, and actually not all of them, that were predicted by understanding across five different markets what the future of online collaboration would be, was delivered by somebody else. Why? It was not their core mission. They couldn't do it because it wasn't who they were. They wanted it to be them. They had many failed things. But it really wasn't who they were. We have to find out who we are, and we have to figure out either that we could radically alter the business focus and the culture, or that we find the next right thing for us. And if you have a cash cow that already exists, and all of your resources and energies are on your cash cow, it is real hard to focus on this other thing. And anybody who's ever tried to do it knows that it is prone to failure. And if you don't have the skill in the newest technology, you're going to trip all over yourself. That is just the reality of what it means to be part of a business. But every business can go and find the adjacencies to their existing business. Every business can understand their customer. Every business can understand what transforms people. Every business can figure out what the barriers are, and every business can put in fun and joy. You just have to do it, and you have to have a process that lets the design team do it. 
Practical innovation will lead to market success. It is always built on a keen understanding of practice and using foundational materials when they are ready for combination and recombination. But it is also about a very deep honesty about your organization. And it is very much about figuring out how to get pieces out and get feedback about your piece in the context of success as much as you can, or accepting that there's going to be experiments with failure. But in the end, if you have no patience, you will not be successful. Because you need to understand all of those pieces if you're going to ship a game-changing innovation. So what is practice, this award that I'm up here for? It's helping companies produce practical innovation. That is practice. That's what it's about. It's what we do. I think it helps the economy. What do you think? In the end, our job is to put the customer in the center of our design, our mind, and our thought process. But the customer alone, technology alone, none of this alone will be enough for radical transformation. Thank you. OK, we have time for some questions. Uh, go to either of the microphones and uh, ask away. Gregory. Aaron Gregory. I'm Gregory A. Goff from Georgia Tech. Uh, wow. Uh, I have I gotta begin with an apology. Number one, I've never heard you speak. I'm sorry about that. Number two, I'm sorry there aren't enough people in here, but I'm gonna make sure that people see the recorded talk, because this is very inspirational to students, I think, as well. Oh, thank you. So, so so short of me showing this video in my intro to HCI classes, what do you think we can do when we're educating? Uh, I'm probably looking more at undergraduates who, whose aspiration is to go into the practice. What is it you think we can do in terms of uh, changing the way we educate these people? A small question. Yeah. <laughs> From a small person. It's a so. very, very long, long answer. Um, Well, one of the things that everybody has to understand, and I don't even think that you know, people who've been in the in industry for a long time understand that all these elements go into success. We, I think that young people and people today all want to be part of something they think is just like, you know, whatever, consumer, cool, iPhone-ish, Google-ish, whatever the, the hottest, latest thing is. I think it would, be, it would be interesting to have some kind of a history of transformative products and their impact on life. Enterprise applications, for example, were utterly transformative on business. There's all kinds of, of applications that are changing the daily lives of people in work and in practice where there's incredible pain that you cannot believe going on. So there are problems and questions out there that if we could solve them, would radically transform people's lives. And I think people don't know about all these dimensions. I also think that education is a difficult context to learn practice. And I think you're putting in foundational knowledge. The more team-based you can be, the more you can teach things like contextual inquiry or other processes, the more they can learn about the foundational materials and the difference between a material that's ready to go and a material that's not ready to go. I think all those things matter. And the more, I'm sorry, social science developmental psych, social psychology, social science background they have, the more insight they're going to have about how to transform people's lives. It's not really about cognition most of the time. And it's not about technology most of the time. It's about understanding people, their lives, and in context. So I don't know. It's a long answer. And that's as good as I can get right now. <laughs> so other questions? Left you dead. Hi, Karen. Hi. I'm Kim Hi. from Oxford University. Early on, you talked about uh, talking to users while they are doing what they are doing as kind of the offspring for your design. And you also made reference to Pelain's work about uh, tradition and transcendence. OK, and before this guy starts, I haven't seen Kim in years. And Kim is one of the first people that I worked with talking about um, Look at him, he's all gray. 
uh, I've, it's like I gotta get run down and hug you. Uh, talking about um, uh, participatory design and other things, and if it was not for Aarhus and Denmark, believe me, I had no support in those days. And this guy right here, if you would please applaud with me for Kim, is one of the primary people that kept me going. Now you can ask a question. Thank you, Karen. And probably I probably challenge everything I just said, okay? On behalf of all the old good colleagues in participatory design. So going back to my question, you made reference to Pella Eanes' work about, and I would follow on, on tradition and transcendence and talking to people while they're doing is really grounding your design in the tradition. But how do you see innovation coming in? Well, that is the fundamental question, actually, that almost every team asks us. Because they start with the idea that if you study people in situ, that you will not be designing for the future, okay? I, I mean, I literally get this question weekly. Now, you could ask yourself, where does the future come from? Because remember, when we go out into the field, we never say to people, what do you need or what do you want, ever? Because if you are unconscious of your behavior and of what you are doing, how do you know what you need or want? I will never forget the day when Hugh was on the, we were just starting the business, so here we are telling everyone to do user-centered design, blah, blah, blah. We get a call from some computer company, and it's some survey, and they, and they say to him, so here we are struggling with our computing on a daily basis, right? Tor being tortured in side-by-side, -side, whatever we were doing. And they say to him, what is the most important thing? And he looks at me, because they're interrupting his work, right? And he says, well, make it faster. And that, you know, okay, so that surveys. You go home, you say, oh, we have to make it faster. I mean, we need to understand the power of contextual data. The power of contextual data is to understand the ground on which you are designing, and then to think about what is the leap and stretch that technology can do. Now, from our perspective, and we've had some of these conversations, we believe that users are equally not conscious of the technology. And so they are not conscious of their own behavior and they are not conscious of the technological possibility. So what is going on? We steep the designers who are always trying to design, or in the days when we started the coders, who would code up anything. If we dip them in user life and they know the technology, they start inventing things that are way closer to something somebody wants. So what we're doing is creating the milieu for invention. Now, sometimes when we were doing imagining the future with our, youth, with our customers, what we tried to do is in situ introduce a couple of new practical technologies and then have them play act out what their future world will be right in their home after a contextual interview. It's like folding contextual design a little bit in hand. And in that context, because they were just made aware of their own lives. And we've now just introduced them to, not a lot, a few technologies. They can start to invent in their own space, not in a lab, not any place else. But it is not going to work for it to be conscious. So what we say is we don't ask users what we, they want. We understand what they do. We invent knowing the technology and the, all the rest of the elements in our business. And then we get back out into the field and we mock it up and we prototype it and we allow the user to respond to our concept and that is the way we can get it validated and iterated. So that is what we have done for years. But it is not, how do you see the future? You need to see the future by knowing what is happening and by knowing what is technologically possible and what materials you're building from. If we work with an advanced research group, our materials are going to be different. And so what they can imagine is going to be different because we'll be doing foundational research, right? It's not going to be ready for prime time, not ready to ship. As you manipulate what's technologically possible, your future changes. But if you do not then get back out into the field and start iterating with real people, and I'm not talking about a usability test. I'm talking about doing your iteration in the field with some kind of a mock-up that looks like life playing, yeah? You will not learn that you are introducing new hassles. And how many times have we done that? Right? That we are not, in fact, half the projects that we work on, we go and gather data so we can find out all the things that technology is torturing people about, and then we make recommendations on how to eliminate it. I mean, what if you just did that first? I mean, 
So that's what we do. Thank you, Kim. It's a good setup. Uh, Larry Constantine, University of Madeira. Uh, oh, wait, I have to stop on Larry. <laughs> <laughs> when Hugh and I started the business, we had no idea how to be a consultant. We knew Larry, so we called him up and we said, Larry, how do you be a consultant? And he came over and gave us consulting lessons. So I also <laughs> want to thank Larry for introducing us to our field. <laughs> Unfortunately, my Johns are not here, John Bennett and John Whiteside. Well, you're most welcome. Um, I have heard you speak before many, many times, uh, and the delight is that I, I still can get things uh, out of it. So I want to I thank you again for, for this presentation. I, I have a, a, a question that contains in it a bit of a, a challenge. Um, not surprisingly, I'm in complete agreement with you about how people don't really know what they're doing, and if you ask them, you actually have already changed the game, so you're not really finding out about what they, what they need or what they want. Um, but there is, for us as professionals, a notion of reflexive practice and the reflective practitioner. And certainly my guess is, uh, as somewhat of a methodologist, and I as a methodologist, one of the things that informs our work is thinking about how we work. Um, and uh, I wondered if you have any thoughts about teaching that, because I find that the very best designers do a lot of this reflective practice in which they think about what they're doing and how they're doing it and how they can do it better. But I have to admit, I have been a complete failure as, as, a, as a teacher in trying to teach young people how to do this. Thanks, Larry. Um, all right. Among the many accusations that occurred over the years it was somebody accused us of being atheoretic, okay? And, and in the introduction to our first book, um, the person who was introducing us said, we're so happy there's no theory in contextual design because we don't like all that theory stuff, okay? Well, the reality is that there's enormous amounts of knowledge about human behavior, social behavior, teams, team dynamic, and all kinds of quality methodologies and everything else that's stuffed into contextual design, and that includes reflection on what you're doing. Every step of the way. Part of what's going on with contextual design is that we design it as a team-based process because things are built in teams, in organizations, and part of what happens in the team-based process is that they have what we call a process check, and we build it right into the week where they can say what's working and what's not working about themselves, about their design, and who's annoyed with who. Because let me assure you, the things don't ship not because the technology is bad, but because the people get all annoyed with each other and can't stand each other and go off to their separate spaces and managers get sick of trying to manage it and as a result, they say, no, I'm breaking it up into a bunch of little parts and you will be responsible for the six parts and then we'll integrate it and when we're all done, we have a very unusable system. So managing teams is absolutely essential for practical design. So contextual design builds in design meetings, meeting management, it builds in time for thinking and reflecting and discussing. And if you just march through the whole thing, you will notice that it has reflection and creation and reflection and creation and reflection and creation simply part of the process. So I could say, how do you teach it? But anyway, it's already built in. So we could do more. And it is also the case that those of us who are leading teams and thinking about our business, we reflect you know, in the days that Hugh and I were starting out where we hardly knew what we were doing, we basically had a little like, how did we do today at the uh, process check at the end of every single day and change. And the methodology was, you know, changing over time prior to writing the book and after writing the book. If you're committed to excellence, reflection is simply part of the process. And also, design has what we call a break-fix cycle. In other words, you want to build that in on purpose, going out into the field and iterating with users in the moment, in their lives, with real situation, with a paper mock-up, a non-beautiful thing, so they feel like they can interact with you, is part of breaking your idea on purpose, and then you come back and you fix it, and then you go out and you break it. And that is reflexive design built into the process. So what I would really encourage you all to do is ask, what am I doing in my process, and have I built in reflection? Hi. I'm Mario Romero from Georgia Tech. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I want to spend 
a few seconds talking about where I'm coming from with this question. Um, my mom was a single mom and she was an academic and she struggled a lot to get to where she got and, <coughs> sorry, I lived a lot through it. And this year, Kai is, is recognizing, is having a huge recognition of women. Um, we started with uh, Genevieve Bell. Um, Lucy Sachman is gonna be recognized this afternoon. You're recognized and so I have one of those short questions. Uh, what can, <laughs> what can us guys, and, and you mentioned in your talk, it was just guys talking about technology and... and well, it was at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I know, I've been there. Um, what can guys learn? And uh, you've been talking about it. You've been talking about the focus on, on users, the focus on people. I want, I want your reflection first. I would like to hear your reflection first on, on women being recognized here at Kaias the way they are so powerfully. And also, um, what can we learn as a community? And guys, yes. What is with you? I mean, like, how am I supposed to answer these questions? Um, <laughs> somebody's going to interview me in a little bit about the history of women in Kai or some such thing. And um, all right. So I got to tell you, I'm the first of six kids. It's me and then four boys. And my sister, who comes last, was one when I got married, OK? So I've been in a testosterone-based culture my whole life. For me to walk into engineering was like trying to lead the boys. You know what I mean? I already had that experience. And as a feminist, or as somebody who was part of the feminist movement, I always consider myself a battering ram. So you know, my goal in life is to bust down as many doors as possible. And you know, coming into this community, it's true. If you take a look at the people who are doing design today, you're going to see more and more and more women because they have a, a different sensibility about the social sciences and about design uh, than the guys do. And so there's a natural movement towards women in the field. And I'll tell you that as women simply become part of teams, teams have to change. So I will actually point any of you men who want lessons on how to work with women over to David Rondeau over here, who is my design chair. And when he came into the company 10 years ago, um, you know, by the time Hugh and I had worked together, because Hugh is another person to talk to about that, he had to learn how to work with women. There's all kind of really bad stuff that is traditional that goes on between men and women. And uh, so the first thing that guys have to learn is never open a door. Do not do the uh, directions. Never lift a suitcase. Never disempower women. Don't do any of that stuff that you might still be learning. No, it's not being polite if the women have baggage around it. And so part of what's going on is that you have to, when David came into the company, I gave him a lecture on how you have to interact with women. And when we were coaching women back in the early days, sometimes we would make all women teams and separate them, even if it was a mixed group, so that we could do empowering, there's a lot of things I've been doing for a lot of years, okay? Empowering things to the women so they couldn't hide. Because even today I see women hiding behind the men. And so we have to, the men have to participate in not letting them hide. And men have too much of this caretaker thing in them. And they have to quit doing it. And I'm sorry, ladies, but that is the way it has to be. The best thing Hugh ever did for me back in the days of Deck, I was like having these thoughts. You know how you have those thoughts? You talk to someone, oh, the world should be this. I think it should be blah, 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 right? OK, so we're going around. And Hugh's standing up in a meeting. He's an architect. And he says, without telling me, mind you, Karen has some thoughts to share. That was it. I was now, he like, whoosh, out of the carriage and into the fire. Another time, he just said to me, here's the pen. Go lead. Takes a big guy to do something like that. Oh, a threatened guy. He asked a question he doesn't like the answer. <laughs> so I have a completely different life perspective because I'm the 10 to 12 children. Yeah. Half boys, half girls. Um, you're saying to women to be more like men, and I think Margaret's question was, how can men be more like women? Well, you all can do that. My husband of 40 years was incredibly supportive so that I could start this company, and he had to break down the walls of his company to get them to understand 
that he was going to stay home with the kids when they were sick and that they should stop calling me at work because he was the primary person to call. This has been going on for over 20 years, folks. So the men who are young today ought to have a different sensibility than the women, but there are some things that are truly stuck. And what I'm saying is that both men and women have to have this consciousness. For the women, it looks like, don't ask. And it's not about women becoming like men. It's about self-empowerment. It's about feeling your own power. It's about knowing that you can do something. It's about never losing sight of your own personal power. And there are ways in which the way things are in society cuts that down. And if you think that I could live my life without the incredible support of men and women everywhere, you are utterly wrong. Utterly wrong. But there are days and days in which I have to go, Karen, you lost your power. Go in the closet, put on a power suit. <laughs> right? Everybody has to find their personal power. But in the male-female dynamic, something else is happening. So you ask the question. If you don't like the answer, I already got my lifetime award, and so that's that. <laughs> On that very positive note, we'll bring, <laughs> we'll bring this to an end. Uh, I share Gregory's uh, view that I hope this, uh, the, the video of this gets wide dissemination because it was a very inspiring and interesting talk. Thank you.